Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome our keynote speaker for the day, Sir William Cash, MP. I hope you can all hear me properly. Apparently some people could hear some of the remarks I was making earlier, so there, some of those are on the record already, no doubt. Um, the, the position is that um, what Barry has just said is really true. And uh, I just want to pay tribute to you, uh, because uh, when I first rang up Patrick Robertson, uh, he was still at Keeble College, Oxford. He hadn't decided at that point to leave, and I said he, but he had got this instinct that we were not going to be able to carry out our ability to regain our ability to govern ourselves unless the, the Bruges Group was set up. It was after the Bruges Group speech, and I just mentioned that because uh, I had um, dinner with him in German Street, and that was in a way the moment, I think, when he came to the conclusion that he would, and he stepped down from his position at Oxford University uh, in order to set up the Bruges Group. And I think it's really important that you should know that, um, and also perhaps to reflect on the fact that uh, the Bruges Group was also um, the mainspring of all the arguments for a very, very long time and remains so to this day. Uh, the European Foundation, of which I'm the chairman, I set up at around the same time, and uh, Margaret, this is really the point I want to make, became patron of both. So she always understood where we were going to, and she gave us 100% support throughout the whole of her, the rest of her life. What is this really all about? Yes, we have had an enormous victory. Yes, we have a got government now which has brought together in a confluence the, the result of the referendum vote in, on the 23rd of June 2016 when we got 17.4 million people from, from many people's point of view unexpectedly not to me I have to tell you but nonetheless to vote, to leave and then of course the general election which has just taken place. Everything that has gone on since then, the paralysis in Parliament, the fight back by the Remainers, the attempt to reshackle us to the European Union in one shape, form or another, is all part of the history which one day will be properly written. The real truth is that this is and always has been, as Barry said so eloquently just now, about the question of our history, and our own instinctive determination not to be governed by other people. That is the essential quality. And I just simply want to, it's about sovereignty. Sovereignty has been derided many times on the basis that it's an abstraction. Geoffrey Howe used to talk about pooling sovereignty. You can't pool sovereignty. You either have sovereignty or you don't have sovereignty. And sovereignty means the ability to govern yourself through your own elected representatives in your own parliament in a free general election decision so that the laws that are made by those representatives of the people in various constituencies by their own free choice then carry out the decisions of the people. That is therefore the essential quality of sovereignty which is it is actually also democracy. So the paralysis that we saw last year was a repudiation of the sovereignty of the United Kingdom although they claimed the opposite. The point that I wish to make is this, that the decisions that are taken by the government and under Boris Johnson now, and the manner in which you see the confluence, as I said, between the outcome of the general election, where we have a majority of 80, 81, means that we can carry out the decision of the British people in June 2016. It is therefore a perfect democratic and sovereignty combination. 
and it is enormously to our, the credit of those of you here and all the people throughout the country and the members of parliament who contributed to it. I mentioned the Spartans because I have to tell you that without the Spartans uh, in parliament, and several of them are going to be here today, I can absolutely assure you that uh, we, would now, we would not have Boris Johnson as prime minister, we would have the previous administration. There is no doubt about that. And it needs to be taken into account because it really did matter when 28 of us went through the lobbies to ensure that that withdrawal agreement in that shape, in that form, did not go through. So that is a fundamental question which we all have to understand about the present state of affairs. But I do have confidence that Boris Johnson will deliver. And I say that because I've known him for many, many, many years. I have known him since he was the Daily Telegraph correspondent. This is his legacy. And actually, if you look at the fact that the Labour leave marginals to a very significant extent, despite the attempts by some other people to uh, fight us on the, in those marginals, it didn't make any difference. And there is a reason for that, because the instinctive belief of the British people is that they want to govern themselves. And the experience of the Labour leave marginal electorate was very much, if you think about it, born out of the European coal steel community, which was the very origins of the European Union. And Con O'Neill said it was the biggest mistake that Britain ever made. He was the chief negotiator in the 1960s and 70s. And he said the biggest mistake the British people ever made at that time was to underestimate the importance of what had happened when they set up the supranational European coal steel community. And if you take a map of the United Kingdom, as it now stands with so many conservative seats from those areas, and impose upon it the coal steel communities, the coal communities and the steel communities, you will see an almost exact correlation. Those people understood because they were the first victims of this supranationality. So the coal miners and the steel workers are the people whose grandparents in the 1950s witnessed what was happening. It's an instinctive reaction. They understood what was going on. Barry. Hugh Gates goes up, and so is Peter Shaw. I'm not suggesting that you should have mentioned him, but I'm going to do it anyway, and I think you meant to do so. I would have done, Bill, because he had a great input into that speech. He certainly did. Because Peter Shaw, and I, there's a new book, which I want to just mention to you quickly, which has just been published about Peter Shaw, a good read. He was a great Labour leader. It's, this is not just about Conservative and uh, Labour or Liberal Democrat. This is about the British people. This is about a decision taking the referendum. That is why I fought in the Maastricht referendum campaign. And Gloria, where are you, Gloria? Good. Gloria was one of those, I remember there are others in this room, who were part of that campaign which I set up in 1993. And why did I do it? I did it simply because I knew that we would never be able to defeat the collusion between the two front benches. That's what Maastricht was all about. It was to stop European government, which was being created under a treaty which would be binding upon us and would be enacted in that Maastricht, these Maastricht proceedings. It was a denial of our democracy. That was the reason. It was a denial of our sovereignty. And it was a denial of our history. One could live, perhaps, to some extent, with some of the preceding attempts to find cooperation in Europe. But the bottom line is that sovereignty lies at the heart of it. And it's not an abstract. It's actually how you translate into practical policies which are made day to day in government by acts of parliament and by policy making as a sovereign nation. So I just want to, at this stage, just take your mind back to some of you will remember the speech uh, by John of Gaunt in 
Uh, <laughs> yes. Remember it. <laughs> Remem remember. Before my time. <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit before my time too. But it's worth remembering. It is worth remembering the words that were used by William Shakespeare, put into the mouth of John of Gaunt, because they are so crucial to understanding our history. Because at one level, this is about what was being said then. They understood it. This was the instincts of the British people. This is our history. This is how we have managed to fight our way over the centuries from the days of Richard II right the way through to the present day. And I just want to take you on a little journey by reference to what was said in that speech. He says, England bound in with the triumphant sea is now bound in with shame, with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds. That England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Those words <laughs> encapsulated what the Maastricht Treaty was all about. And we did allow ourselves to be taken into the shackles of the European Union. And we have fought a battle since then of historic proportions and now we have the result that we now witness with a new government. I want also to refer now to uh, Harold Macmillan. On the previous occasion, Barry very kindly presented me with a book called Troublesome Young Men. That was the words that Macmillan used to Neville Chamberlain. And he said, I'm sorry that we're being troublesome young men. Harold Macmillan has often been categorized as a great Euro fanatic. But I tell you, he really did understand what was going on. I'm not going to give you a history lesson about Harold Macmillan, but I am going to quote to you something from his own diaries in July 1960, at the very time and just before Gateskill made his speech, which Barry so rightly referred to. And it, 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 it was, the, the diary entry goes like this. Very tired, st this is the 9th of July 1960. Very tired, stayed in bed. Shall we be caught between a hostile or at least a less and less friendly America and a boastful, powerful empire of Charlemagne? Now, now, in 1960, he says, under French but later to come under German control. Is this the reason, he said, for joining the common market and for abandoning our Commonwealth and the Seven? That summarizes the dilemma that was facing the people at that time. And it was all understood by our leaders. So fast forward to the negotiations which were being conducted when Theresa May was Prime Minister. Some of you will remember a Channel 4 programme, do you remember it? In which the following words were announced and declaimed as they pumped the air and shouted for joy during the course of the negotiations. Remember now what I said just now in quoting from uh, Richard, the, Richard II and John of Gaunt's speech about England bound in with shame, that we were being conquered by others. But listen to this. This is what they said on that television programme. It's a documentary. This is word for word. This is their, the negotiators speaking on the record in that programme about us. This is them speaking. We got rid of them. We kicked them out. It took two years, but we managed it. It's done. On our terms and conditions, we finally turned them into a colony. And this was our plan from the first moment. Now think about that in the historical context that you've heard so far. The point is that these negotiations that we're now engaged in are now on a completely different footing. Our sovereignty is restored, and I'll mention a little bit about that in a second, 
in a way that enables our Prime Minister to give effect to that confluence between the decision taken by the British people in 2016 and in the general election this year. Everything turns ultimately in terms of policy making and in terms of legislation and our ability to govern ourselves on the outcome of that decision by the British people in December last year. We have the ability now, we have not only the capacity, we have the willpower to be able to regain our democracy and also to implement it. We can all feel that we have our democracy, but you can't exercise it unless you have the ability to do it through passing the relevant legislation. So these negotiations are going to be somewhat difficult. I believe, and I say this with optimism, not certainty because nobody can be certain about the way things will go. What I do know and believe is that the Prime Minister will negotiate really hard during them. You've seen the Greenwich speech, you have seen the Frost speech last week, week 10 days ago, and the guidelines for our negotiations are clear. We will govern ourselves. We will regain our sovereignty. It is not going to be based upon their terms and conditions as they were under the previous administration. My European Scrutiny Committee, I wrote the report myself, pointed out that we had capitulated to their terms and conditions at the beginning of the negotiations uh, before Chequers. And Chequers itself was a disaster. So for practical purposes, sovereignty lies at the heart of our democracy and our ability to govern ourselves. So you may say, what is the way in which we can implement our ability to carry through these negotiations? What is it that would enable us, if they go badly wrong, to be able to walk away? Because I have to tell you that although I trust, as indeed they said that Boris wouldn't succeed in the first round, that he will himself be faced, as we move down this pathway, this journey, to be faced with some very, very difficult decisions. <coughs> However, he has got in the Act of Parliament, which nobody so far has even noticed in the commentariat, I despair of them sometimes, but actually there are two provisions in the Withdrawal Act 2020, which I am glad to be able to tell you, this is the first real opportunity that I've had, so I'm very glad in the, in, in the context of my relationship with the Bruges Group, that I set up the Friends of Bruges Group in 1989 and all that, to be able to tell you that that Act of Parliament contains two provisions. You may know about them, you may not, but I'm going to tell those who don't know about them what they contain. First of all, there is a section which asserts parliamentary sovereignty, notwithstanding the withdrawal agreement. And the second one is it gives my committee the power to determine whether or not, this is the European Scrutiny Committee, under our standing orders, as amplified by this Act of Parliament, the right to make a determination as to whether there are issues which arise during the negotiations which are in conflict with our national vital interests. I drafted these two clauses at 4.30 in the morning, you'll be glad to know, uh, the day after Boris entered into this withdrawal agreement. Why? Because I wanted to insert a concrete, or rather a granite platform underneath the negotiations. So if they did go wrong, there would be a mechanism in Parliament to enable us to decide whether or not, as a Parliament, we regarded something that was being done as against our vital national interests. Nothing could be more important. And indeed in 1971, it said in their white paper before the 72 Act went through, that we would retain the veto under all circumstances because it was essential to our national interests. So this parliamentary sovereignty provision combined with these two clauses ensures that our parliamentary sovereignty can prevail which enables the Prime Minister 
if it comes to it, to make the right decision in our vital national interests. And my committee have, has a role, we're starting work on Wednesday next week, to go through the various rules and regulations that they seek to impose upon us, particularly as we're not going to be at the table for the next few months until the end of December this year, to enable us, first of all, to consult with other select committees on our terms, then for us to write the report as a committee, and I can assure you they're all good men and true, and thirdly, then to present that, and the government has to accept our report and to debate it in the floor of the House of Commons, first time since 1972, and to vote on it. So you put the two things together, and that provides the, me the mechanism, the capacity to be able to face down the European Union if they try to force things down our throats during the next nine months. I thought you would like to know that because that is the basis upon which I know the Prime Minister. He backed me 100%. I was in Downing Street for seven and a half hours that day and I went through it all and he backed me 100%. So I can only, t and there were Remainers who were pushing back. I won't go into the details, but I just want you to know that that was in itself an illustration of his determination. He got it. Now that doesn't mean to say everything's going to be completely plain sailing. It doesn't mean to say that it's, not, it's going to be easy. But we have the will, we have the right to govern ourselves, we have our democracy back. We have unshackled ourselves from the European Union as of the 31st of January. And I say this to you with confidence and with optimism. However hard the journey may look to be, I know that the British people as a whole will be behind the Prime Minister in this great venture. And I go further than to say, we saved Europe twice in the last hundred years. That reference in that speech about our ability to govern ourselves and to assert that the mother of parliaments sits on the throne of sovereignty in the United Kingdom is the most important single fact that I put to you today. That sovereignty enables us to be able to make decisions. Some of them may be, may be wrong, some of them may be difficult, but at least they're our own. They're not imposed on us by a majority of those of other countries. And we will be able, as the Bruges Group always has, to stand up for our freedom and to ensure that we deliver it in the interests of our democracy and in the interests of the British people. Thank you very much.